All right, man, talk to talk. Like, share, subscribe to the page. So today I'll endure a reaction to Andrew Tate's uh, reasoning why he was banned uh, on Tucker Carlson. But we're going to get right into it. Get talking, man. We're going to get right into this. Let's go. Months ago, we'd never heard of him. And then the other day, virtually every tech company on the planet banned him. Not just his presence, but also his ability to conduct business on the Internet. He was taken off Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, all of it. Then they started telling you that not only was he not allowed to talk, but that you weren't allowed to like him because he was an incredibly bad person. And our view on that always is we'll decide for ourselves since we're adults and Americans and we'll listen to anyone we want. We'll come to any conclusion we care to come to about what that person is about. So we sat down at some length and talked to Andrew Tate and we wanted to show you some of it so you could make up your own mind, which you're still allowed to do as far as we're concerned. Here's part of the interview. I don't really feel like I've exposed anything. Like I'm truly not a very political person. This is the first time someone's experienced this level of ban. I'm not particularly right wing. I don't vote. I mean, I obviously have my own personal views, but they didn't ban me for that. Um, they banned me simply because I had large swaths of the population agreeing to very traditional masculine values, teenage men and young, and young men, 20, 30, 22, 23, 24, were looking up to me and aspiring to be like me. I have a very traditionally masculine life. I have fast cars and a big house and, and a lot of money and a beautiful girlfriend. And they thought they thought this was very, very threatening. And for some reason, they decided that it's better if they annihilate me from the internet and replace me with somebody who's more aligned with whatever they're trying to purport. Tell us what your message is to young men. Yeah, so I think that being a man is very, very difficult. I think that men's issues are largely overlooked. The people in charge of the world pretend to care, but when somebody who's champion, champion, championing men's issues like myself comes forward and finally manages to garner huge percentiles of the public support, I'm silenced. So they're not really interested in men's issues. And there's a lot of young men growing up today that feel very disaffected. They feel invisible. The agendas that are being forced down their throats are not agendas they align with or they feel affinity to or agendas they want. And I basically just say to men, look, it's a very hard life. You're going to need to get up, work hard, go to the gym. Strong body is a strong mind. You're going to have to reject listening blindly to everything you're told. Reject the slave mind. Think for yourself. Get a strong network of brothers. Work aside them. Don't tolerate low quality people in your life which means don't tolerate men who just smoke drugs and play video games or men who are disloyal or dishonest. By extension, don't tolerate women or girlfriends who are disloyal or dishonest and try and build and create a reality full of high quality people in which you can resist the programming that the matrix tries to infl uh, influence you with and grow up truly happy. And what happens is when I say these things, they ignore 95% of what I say. They ignore me saying that you need to avoid low quality men and they take the bit where I say avoid women who are dishonest, and then they put it on a, a reel, a very short three or four second clip, and then they say I'm a misogynistic person and I'm dangerous to women and I need to be banned. It's a pro See, that's the problem with society now. Is I would say a couple of years ago we were into this, we was in this this, we was into this world where. Uh, instant gratification was slowly coming into play. Now it's like people actually want that. Now they want the small clip. They want you to define something within five seconds that would take you years to define people wanted it five seconds because they don't have time, patient time to go through and do some research on anything. So they just want it right now, right now. And this is what we get results like him and results like uh, 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 Kevin Samuels, rest in peace. We get stuff like that. And this is what happens. And what people do, they look for the negative reels about them. They don't even look for the actual, the real stuff that they're saying 
And if they do say something of any substance, they cut it off because they don't want to hear that. They just want to hear you say something negative so they can use it to somebody against somebody in an argument. That's all they're looking for. The problem is that the majority of young men in the world today are completely invisible. And social media has made them invisible. If you go into an Instagram feed, you have extremely beautiful women, which is fine. That's they're beautiful. They're allowed to take pictures. But the only men who have followers are men with massive social status, right? Men with Ferraris and money or rappers or people who have YouTube channels, interesting people. If you're a normal man with a normal job, you don't really exist in the online world. It's very difficult to get followers. Nobody replies to your DMs. You don't really matter. You don't have access to the sexual marketplace. It's very difficult for you to even get any kind of recognition that you're even alive. And a lot of men feel lost and lonely because of that. And I was championing to a degree their issues by saying to them, look, that is unfair perhaps, but that's the way the game works. You need to become a man of importance. You need to become a man of influence or you're gonna suffer the pain of being invisible forever. Here is how you do it. I wasn't trying to change the rules of the game. I was just telling the men how to win because I came from nothing and I'm completely and utterly self-made. And I think the reason a lot of men are so depressed is because they feel invisible. They feel like the life is, life is too hard. Women expect me to be strong and smart and funny and interesting with a nice apartment and a fast car and tall and well-connected and funny. And, and it's just too much for them to handle. And the social pressure on men is absolutely immense. And I was championing their issues. And at the same time, all these social media platforms pretend to care. As soon as somebody they resonate with stands up and champions their issues, they mass blanket ban me, which shows they have absolutely no care for the young men of the world today. They think that by banning me, I'm just going to vanish and the young men are just going to go and start eating the gruel that they're fed on their on their YouTube feed. They don't want to read. They don't want to see transgender people wear makeup. They don't want to see that. They, they want to see a man who has a bunch of money and a nice life and some fast cars and is strong and is confident. They want an action hero. And that's something that large portions of the world still want to be. And, and YouTube and, and social media platforms obviously just don't like the idea of that. They want to get rid of me and try and replace me with something they see as far more malleable, trying to create people which are more malleable and more easy to program and more easy to control. So news. That right there is a crazy statement because that is 100% true. What he just said right there, maybe, maybe one of the best statements I heard about the social climate that is a hundred percent true this the, men do feel invisible and I, i'll give it to you like this i've been making youtube videos for years right and i got a couple of followers i don't have that many but i got a couple of followers and some of my videos because I talk about social justice and I talk, I, you know, I push back on the feminist movement and stuff like that. Some of my videos don't even crack 10 views. And I know that my production is good. All this stuff is good. I have everything set up, but I'm not a wealthy guy. You know what I'm saying? But I'm still doing something that I believe people want to hear. And eventually your, your audience grows and I know this. But YouTube has shadow banned me. I'm sure they have because before I was getting views when I wasn't talking about social justice stuff and feminist, the feminist movement or Trump or anything like that. As soon as I start talking, start talking about that stuff, they shadow ban me. Now I basically don't get as many views because I'm not, the algorithm doesn't, they push, it pushes me down. Every time I release a video, it doesn't even get seen because there's so many people doing you know what I'm saying? And I understand I have all these subscribers and not none of my subscribers see my videos. I don't I don't I don't get it. But yeah, he's 100 percent correct about that. Accounts in the United States say that the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest, Romania, was tipped off to your misdeeds and alerted the local authorities you might be committing human trafficking. Um, Given that this is the same charge they leveled against Julian Assange or a species of it, you know, skeptical, but I, I want to know the details. Were you arrested for human trafficking? What, what happened? Yeah, I was not arrested. So what happened is I suffered from a case of swatting. It's very popular with people who are large on the Internet. Many large YouTubers have been swatted. 
It's where you call the police and you say somebody has a gun or there's a hostage situation and the SWAT team arrives. Somebody made a phone call to the American embassy saying that I was holding women at my house. The police arrived. And let me state this now. I state this uh, openly to the world. I have absolute respect for the police. I would hate to live in a country where if you call the police saying women are being held against their will, that the police don't respond. That would be terrible. Of course they should come and look. Absolutely. They turned up. They investigated. They realized that nobody was in the house against their will. There was no crime committed. They said, okay, you're not a suspect, but you are a witness to this, along with me, my brother, the housekeeper, uh, the gardener. Everybody who was in the premises at the time was labeled a witness. We had to go to the police station for 45 minutes for pieces of paper. We filled them in and we were let go. I was swatted. Nobody was hurt. There's no human trafficking. There's no women who were tied up. There's none of these things. It's all just complete fallacy. You probably made... Now you see how this, that just goes to show you about the real... I never heard about that story, but that just goes to show you about how these reels, these Facebook reels, and I know Facebook, Instagram, and uh, uh, YouTube, and all of them did that on purpose because they want people to get information faster. And by getting people information faster, watching videos like this takes too long. So they want to get people information faster. I haven't seen nobody post a reel about that right there. You know what I'm saying? But I seen I I haven't seen that, but I heard about the reels that people were saying that uh, he, he was doing human trafficking. Oh, yeah, Andrew Tate is a human trafficker. And it's like, really, dog? He really? Come on, you should know better than that. Like, stop. Stop it. Some of these companies mad with your views on COVID. So sum up for us, if you would, what you think the response to COVID globally did to the populations of the West. Yeah, so I certainly made them mad with my views on COVID. I don't want to go to conspiracy theory, and I would also never kill myself. Let me just say that here for, for, for the record. But okay. at the time of COVID, at the time of COVID first being announced, my brother and I decided to, we sat and had a very logical conversation, and we sat and said, we're two young fighting age males. If COVID can kill us, then the world is over. It's zombie apocalypse time. So there's no point hiding. We may as well go out with a bang. So my brother and I flew to Stockholm, Sweden. Now, I don't know if many people know this, but Sweden never closed down. Stockholm and Sweden had never closed down, never made you wear masks, never mandated the vaccine. At the very beginning of COVID, when the rules were strictest, when Florida was still closed, when Miami was still closed, when the Republican states were still closed, Stockholm, Sweden was wide open with full nightclubs and a party scene like you've never seen. And we lived in Sweden for three solid months with zero restrictions, zero worry or interest in COVID. It was like the world was completely normal. And from there, when we left, obviously COVID was still going on. And in a neighboring country, you go to Germany, and they were having full panic attacks, genuine panic attacks if you didn't have a mask on. And it was just very obvious to me. I was like, I've spent the last three months ignoring this, and I'm fine. And now I'm in Germany surrounded by panic attacks and endless masks. This, this doesn't make sense. And I told the truth on social media. I said, this is obviously an overreaction, the decimation of your income, the fact you can't go get a doctor's appointment for a genuine ailment or a genuine risk of cancer, for example, the fact that you can't see your loved ones in their final days. These things are far more destructive than the common cold. I think that what they're doing is, is unfair. I think it's a massive overreaction. And this is based on my personal experience. And I think at the time there was a lot of pushback, but I would like to think now that 99% of the world see I was totally right. You know, it's kind of funny, Tucker, I'll tell you, when at the height of COVID, I used to say to my brother, how will people struggle with the cognitive dissonance when this is all over? Because COVID is still out there. Nothing's gone away. The thing that we were all hiding from is still right there, out there to get you. But now everyone walks around and they're not scared of it anymore. And I'm like, are people critical enough to analyze themselves and say, for a year of my life, I was deathly afraid of something. Now I'm exposing myself to said thing and I'm not afraid anymore. The media tricked me and I was a fool, but they're not. They're, they don't even seem to self-analyze and go, I got tricked. They're just like, oh, okay, next thing. Hey, Andrew now, like robots. It's. 
It's mind bending to me, truly. So I, I. So, all right. It's a couple of things he said there that I, uh, I agree with. Some things I kind of like. I ain't gonna say disagree with, but some things like, well, of course, as we go on, time goes on. I know COVID is still out there, and uh, not any way, shape, or form, YouTube am I telling people not to take the vaccine? But, um, I think that the vaccine. And I'm not, I'm not gonna say it worked fully, but I think that it it, it played a part in why people are not scared no more. Um, as far as everything else he said, I think he said I think he said the truth. Like it is still out there. Now you do got people still wearing masks, but people were overreacting to a certain point. I will say that. I will say that. How you compare the experience of rich people under COVID, you're one of them, to everybody else? What did you notice about that? It, it seemed like a two-tiered response. Yeah, so the story was very simple. I was flying inside of Europe. There's a lot of low-cost air, uh, air carriers. It's only low-cost primarily. There's not much first-class, business-class, anything like that. And I was flying, and my experience was plagued by endless paperwork, wearing a mask, put the mask over your nose. Every time you eat, you have to put the mask on in between. Uh, I got told off for not having the mask up high enough. I got told off for drinking too long because my mask wasn't on. Pure panic and chaos. And because I'm fortunate enough to be fiscally secure, from there I decided I'll just buy private jets from now on. And when I bought a private jet, there was no masks, no paperwork, no mask at the airport. When I landed, my air stewardess was not wearing a mask. My pilot was not wearing a mask. COVID didn't exist once I bought a private jet. Very interesting. Um, I maybe if you're rich enough, COVID can't take, maybe COVID's scared of money, I'm not sure. But it seems that everyone who's flying on private jets never had to worry about COVID ever. It's just the people at the bottom who had to worry about COVID. And it's kind of interesting, right? Life's always been two tiered. There's always been this separation in regards to fiscal access. But I think a lot of people in the world today don't realize that it still very much exists. And a lot of the rules are only the rules for a certain class of people. And once you pass a certain wealth index or a certain level of money, that you can do basically whatever you want. And, and COVID really highlighted that to me. And it's truly sad. I mean, it's easy for me to make a joke of it, but when I would fly on a private jet and do whatever I wanted or go to Sweden and party in nightclubs and do whatever I wanted, and then I'd come to, let's say, England and see my friend who couldn't go see his dying grandmother because of a COVID restriction, that's truly sad. That's truly criminal. I don't... I, it's really crazy what's happened and how the world's just moved on and the cognitive dissonance that people don't have enough respect for themselves and for the truth to analyze how they were so easily fooled. It, it's really sad to even think about, but maybe that was the beginning of me being disliked by just pointing out my human experiences during the, the pandemic. But I want to tell you something that's, that's actually kind of scary about this banning. It all came so hard and so fast that I don't know if they all just follow each other. I don't know if they're all influenced by each other. I don't know if there's someone above them all. I don't know. But when they go to cancel you, ladies and gentlemen, it comes hard and fast. You lose your Facebook, then your Instagram, then your Gmail, then your Discord, then your website hosting, then your domain name, like then your payment processor, then your bank. Then like It's just like in real time, you're watching your phone and apps just exploding. Boom, boom, boom. It's it's crazy. Yeah, man. That was a pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Pretty good interview, man. That was pretty good, man. I think that uh what he said was was hundred percent factual, man. See, we all put, we all plug ourselves into these apps, these phones. We plug ourselves into the matrix. We gotta realize that. Excuse me. We gotta realize that we're not in control. We're not in control. And when you put yourself at the mercy of these apps and these like Cash App, PayPal, Instagram, uh, Google Wallet, and all this stuff, and and Facebook marketplace and Facebook and once you start living there and you do something that they don't particularly like they can get you out of here and they'll take everything from you and everything that you put into it all of the 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 
all the uh, networking you have done to build yourself up and to, to bring more awareness to their uh, platforms too, you don't get credit for that. And they just get you out of here. So, but shout out to that brother, man. He'll be back though. I'll tell you right now. He'll be back. Torture talk. You know what it is.